Hey men, how's it going? This is Jared, and I'm excited to be giving you guys uh, this week's lecture on uh, Lesson 24, which is John 18, verses 28 through chapter 19, verse 16. Before we go ahead and get started, I do have a couple announcements to go over. First announcement is that this next week, the week of Monday, March 25th, we'll have a class fellowship. Uh, so for those of you that attend the base class, which is our Monday night class at the Journey Church, your fellowships will start at 5.40 p.m. Uh, in your discussion group room. Uh, at at 6.30, you'll go ahead and transition directly into the lesson discussion. And then it's about 7.15, 7.20, uh, we'll ask you guys to come out of your discussion group into the main area for the lecture. For you satellite uh, guys, uh, just do what your group leaders have had you do all year. And the second announcement is that the final BSF mini series of this year is coming up soon. Uh, it's entitled Finding Life and Jesus's Death. Uh, and it'll be over lessons 26 through 28, uh, the weeks of Monday, April 1st, 8th, and 15th. So if there are any men that you guys want to invite out to your group, uh, please feel free to do so. And also send them to this link, uh, trybsf.com. At that webpage, they can scroll down to this mini series study, click on their preferred language, and then click download. And it'll download the three lessons for them out of the printed book for this year's study for them to get a head start on so that they'll be ready to go April 1st. Well, those are the announcements that I have. So with that, let's go ahead and dig right in to our lecture. So we live in a day and age when information has never been more accessible. Consider that most of us own a device that enables us to connect to the internet and gives us the ability to find answers to almost any question imaginable. If there is something you wish to know, chances are that the answer is already on the internet. And with the addition of social media and a camera, anyone can provide a first-hand account of major events in real time. And now, with some of the advances being made in the fields of data science, machine learning, and artificial intelligence, new information is being processed, analyzed, and released in ways that we are still coming to grasp with. Unfortunately, with such an abundance of information comes the reality that we need to exercise ex extreme discretion as we consume, process, and respond to the information that's out there. There are those who seek to abuse, twist, or obfuscate truth for their personal gain. Does that social media account posting a, requ a request for donations have a history longer than a few weeks, or was it just created? Is the news article with an inflammatory headline from a reputable journalist and institution? Or is it from a relatively unknown or generic source seeking to sow discord and anger instead of unity? Is that picture of someone caught in a compromising position real? Or do all of the people in that picture have six fingers on each hand because artificial intelligence has still not figured out the best way to draw images of hands? We need to exercise discretion in this day and age. And as we continue our study in John, we are presented with a situation where multiple truths are at play. The Jewish leaders assert that Jesus is a criminal, and Pilate asserts that he has ultimate authority over Jesus' future. But John also provides us details of Jesus' discussion with Pilate and the truth that Jesus shares about his kingdom. As we take a step back and scrutinize the sources of these truth claims, 
one thing becomes exceedingly obvious. The truth that Jesus proclaims demands a response. We cannot consider what he claims without considering our response to him. So our scripture this week will be broken up into two divisions. The first division will be challenging truth. It will be John chapter 18, verses 28 through 38, part A. Again, challenging truth. John 18, 28 through 38, A. And the second division will be responding to truth. John 18, 38, B through 19, 16. Again, responding to truth. John 18, 38, part B through chapter 19, verse 16. So please open your Bibles to John 18 as we get started with our first division. So as a quick recap for us, our last lesson covered Jesus' arrest and Peter's denial in the high priest's courtyard. John did not include details of Jesus' trial before Caiaphas the high priest and the Sanhedrin, but begins with the immediate aftermath in verse 28. Then the Jewish leaders took Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now, it was early morning. The Jewish leaders, against the rules of the law, had put Jesus on multiple trials throughout the night. They are concerned only with achieving their one goal, the death of one man for the good of the country, words that Caiaphas had said himself. They did not enter the palace because they wanted to be able to eat the Passover, so Pilate came out to them. Before we continue, we need to stop here and consider the deep levels of irony. Despite a clear disregard of the law with their late-night conduct, and even though they are actively trying to execute the Messiah, they refuse to enter the Roman governor's house out of a concern that they will become unclean. The notes this week provide additional insight into the motivations and politics of the Jewish leaders, so make sure you read them this week. However, it would be spiritually negligent of us to consider the irony of their actions without pausing to reflect on our own. The Jewish leaders were prioritizing and pursuing external cleanliness, cleanliness that can be observed, recognized, and celebrated by the world, while ignoring the cleanliness of their hearts. Were they truly clean? Are there situations in your lives or in my life where we may present a clean or worthy front while still harboring unclean motives or thoughts? But looking now at verse 29. So Pilate came out to them and asked, What charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, they objected. This took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death he was going to die. The Jewish leaders want Jesus put to death. However, as was common for the Roman Empire, local governing bodies were stripped of the rights to carry out capital punishment when becoming client states of the Roman Empire, and the Jews were no exception. The leaders have brought Jesus to Pilate as they lack the legal standing to condemn Jesus to death themselves. They seek for Jesus to be crucified. Despite their conniving plans, John reminds us as readers that every aspect of this plot is under God's sovereign control and it is unfolding just as he willed it. This is all part of God's greater plan of redemption 
for his people. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea? Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? As with Annas, Jesus controls the conversation by responding to Pilate with questions of his own. Jesus' question to Pilate challenges the truth that the Jewish leaders were trying to push, asking Pilate to consider for himself the truth of that statement. Does Pilate personally personally believe in what he is asking of Jesus? What about us? How should we respond to Jesus' question? Is what we believe something that we have taken ownership of ourselves, spending time in reflection, prayer, and understanding? Or is it simply a belief we latch onto because it was told to us? Well, when faced with this question, Pilate defensively withdraws and suggests that he has no personal understanding of the subject, as he is not a Jew, but rather a Roman citizen. Such a concept as the king of the Jews is unnecessary for him to consider. So as God challenges our comforts or beliefs, can we be tempted to also respond defensively? Regardless, Jesus challenges Jesus is challenged for us to critically evaluate the sources of truth that we cling to remains. Jesus requires that we hold those sources of truth up against the truth that he brings. Pilate continues with another question for Jesus. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? But Jesus is not done revealing truth to Pilate. Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. Jesus' response to Pilate reveals two things. First, that it does indeed point to his kingship. And second, is that it points towards the heavenly nature of his kingdom. Both claims would have been challenging for Pilate to understand, and can be challenging for us to understand today as well. Well, you are a king then, said Pilate. What first comes to mind when I ask you to envision a kingdom? I know that I am certainly inclined and I would venture to guess that you are as well, to picture a medieval setting, castles with high walls and long unfurled banners flapping in the wind, strong gates, large throne rooms, and with a king sitting on the throne. But this is not what Jesus' kingdom looks like. As Jesus said, his kingdom is not of this world. So what is this kingdom? And what is meant by the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is characterized by God's sovereign rule and reign over the earth and heaven throughout history. From the beginning of creation, when he spoke reality into existence from nothingness, everything has been under his perfect authority. The kingdom of God is a present reality. God is actively ruling over the world today. Just as all things were a part of his sovereign plan when Jesus went to the cross, everything today remains part of his sovereign plan. But there remains an aspect of the kingdom of God that extends beyond the now. Jesus speaks of a kingdom in the future when he, Jesus, the Messiah, returns and reigns forever over an eternal kingdom, fulfilling God's promise to King David. When Jesus returns, 
all will realize his true kingship as king of kings and lord of lords. This kingdom of God is open to all who choose to believe the eternal truth that Jesus brings and to accept his eternal gift of salvation. The kingdom of God grows when the gospel is shared and people personally embrace God's rule and reign in their hearts. However, at Jesus' second return, God's kingdom closes to all who do not believe. The concept of the kingdom of God challenges us because it requires us to respond to its existence. And how we choose to respond dictates how we live our life. Jesus challenged Pilate's source of truth by asking if this was your idea or something you heard. Then Jesus challenged Pilate's idea of truth, that Jesus himself truly was a king, not of an earthly kingdom, but of a greater heavenly kingdom. We are faced with the same questions and challenges today that Jesus posed to Pilate. What do you and I believe is the truth about Jesus? Jesus claims to be a king, and not just the king of God's kingdom, but king over the lives of you and I. Looking at Jesus' response to Pilate in verse 37, You say that I am king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. This is Jesus' claim, not just seen here in this passage, but woven throughout all of Scripture. It is the truth that is our principle for this division, that Jesus, the King of all rightly things, claims absolute authority over our lives. Jesus, the king of all rightly things, claims absolute authority over our lives. What do you make of this truth? When it comes down to what rules your life, is Jesus your first answer? Or do you find yourself letting things like family, career, or hobbies rule instead? Do you... Do you own your beliefs about Christ, or do you simply repeat what you have heard? How do you respond to Jesus' challenge that he wants to be king in your life? We see Pilate's response. Rather than pursuing to understand the eternal truth that Jesus revealed to him, he simply asks, what is truth? And rejects further understanding of Jesus and his kingdom. How do you choose to respond to Jesus' promptings? Do you try to deflect what feels uncomfortable? Will you ask God to help you sit in the discomfort and surrender yourself to Jesus, the one who has absolute claim on us as king? At this point, at this point, Pilate returns to the Jewish leaders waiting outside. I find no basis for a charge against him, but it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, No, not him. Give us Barabbas. Pilate, as the Roman procurator or governor of the region, was the ultimate Roman legal authority. Pilate had no reason to charge Jesus with any crime. For those of you keeping score at home, that's a not guilty verdict. But just as Pilate chose to disregard Jesus' eternal truth, Pilate chose not to accept the responsibility of his position 
in this matter of releasing Jesus. Pilate was not willing to simply release Jesus as an innocent man. Instead, he would hide behind this Passover custom and hope that he could release Jesus through the choice of the Jewish masses. Let's bring in some historical context to help us understand the political situation Pilate found himself in. First, the Roman governor of Judea predominantly resided in Caesarea, approximately 70 miles to the northwest of Jerusalem. However, they would travel to Jerusalem with Roman troops during major holidays to ensure peaceful stability during the celebration and to be a deterrent to those who may want to cause trouble. Additionally, we know that Pilate is currently not in the good graces of the Roman emperor of the time, Tiberius, though the reason why is not exactly known. One academic theory states that this is due to the fact that the individual who appointed Pilate to his position had a major falling out with Tiberius himself and was killed because of it. So anyone who could be considered a sympathizer or political ally of this individual was suspect, including Pilate. Regardless, Pilate's political career is in jeopardy. The last thing he needs or wants during this Passover celebration is to upset the Jewish leaders. Yet this just leads to more irony. The Roman authority chooses not to fulfill his legal obligations and instead acquiesces to the demands of the local leaders, not only minimizing the perception of Roman stability, but also releasing a prisoner that John distinctly tells us led active rebellion against Roman authority. But seeing that the Jewish leaders would not consider the release of Jesus, Pilate took him and had him flogged and tortured. Flogging involved being whipped by several long straps of leather that had metal, rocks, or bone fragments tied in throughout the length of each strap. It was common for those who experienced flogging to pass out or even die, as chunks of flesh could easily be removed and they could be cut down to the bone with each lash. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in purple in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and they slapped him in the face. Pilate had hoped that subjecting Jesus to the torture would gain him sympathy in the Jewish crowds and that they would be persuaded to ask for Jesus to be released. But that is not what happens. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! Again, Pilate states that he has not found any guilt in Jesus, but the Jewish leaders insisted, We have a law, and according to that law, he must die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. Until this point, John has not indicated that Pilate was fearful, but when the Jewish leaders reveal their real motivation for seeking the death of Jesus, Pilate starts to become concerned. Remember, his motivation is to get through Passover without creating a reason for Rome to scrutinize his rule more than it already is. Angering the Jews by ignoring a potential religious offense during one of the most important religious holidays, would certainly be disastrous. Pilate brought Jesus back inside and questioned him again. He asked Jesus where he was from, but Jesus remained silent. There was nothing that Jesus needed to add to what he had already said during their first discussion. Pilate would know the truth if he had chosen to pursue it. Frustrated by Jesus' silence, Pilate said, Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? And Jesus answered, 
You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. John tells us that at this point, Pilate tried to set Jesus free. However, the Jewish leader's desire for Jesus' blood would not relent. They threatened Pilate, warning him that if he let Jesus go, he would be operating against the desires of Caesar. And this was the deciding moment for Pilate. Rightfully pro proclaim Jesus as innocent and let him go under the authority of the Roman law, but risk Jewish rebellion, a report of treason, and an end to his political career, or turn Jesus over to the leaders to appease them. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which is which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, Take him away! Take him away! Crucify him! Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. And finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. Pilate's final question to the Jewish leaders reveals his ultimate choice and how he has responded to the truth of Jesus' claims. Pilate decided to reject Jesus' truth. Pilate denied the responsibility of his station and pushed responsibility fully onto the Jewish leaders, washing his hands clean of the matter. By attempting to let them decide Jesus' fate, Pilate inadvertently also made his own choice. His response towards Jesus' eternal truth was a response of rejection. By handing Jesus over to be crucified, Pilate had made his choice to reject Jesus. When it comes to responding to Jesus and his claims, there is no such thing as just sitting on the fence. The only outcomes are acceptance or rejection. We cannot defer our choice to anyone else. We cannot let our friends, families, or even our spouse make the choices for us. Each person bears the responsibility of choosing for themselves, and each person will be held accountable for the eternal choice that they make. As we sit in that truth, we see our final principle for our lecture. Every person either accepts or rejects Jesus' eternal truth. Every person either accepts or rejects Jesus' eternal truth. To what truth of Jesus is the Holy Spirit prompting you to respond? Perhaps it is the truth that Jesus is king over all of your life. Maybe it is the truth that only Jesus' work on the cross and not your own efforts are sufficient for your salvation. As we consider the truths that Jesus reveals, which ones might you be struggling with? What truths might you be compromising, favoring self over Jesus? What truths may you be shying away from or just simply ignore? Many truths about Jesus may be hard to understand and accept. But every truth about Jesus requires a response, and, they on, and the only responses are to accept him and his eternal truth or to reject them. Jesus rightly defines and establishes truth with divine authority. As the king who has absolute claim over our lives, Jesus asks us to accept his e eternal truths, and when we do, it reshapes our lives moving us towards a life that is in line with God's will and the purpose that he has designed for us to best serve his kingdom. As we continue to live the remainder of our lives on earth, there will be many claims of truth made.
May we let the eternal, unchanging truth of Jesus challenge our selfish, worldly ideas and allow them to transform us and grow us in our maturity in Christ. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you for the fact that you came uh, to earth, that you submitted yourself to God the Father's plan and subjected yourself to torture and death on the cross so that we may be be redeemed back to you. Lord, we just pray that you continue to reveal your truths to us in our hearts that we may be that we may respond appropriately God and make your truths the center of our lives and the focus of our lives instead of focusing and centering on ourselves. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Amen.